Margaret Thatcher was wrong. Bobby, Francie, Patsy Raymond, Joe, Kieran, Kevin, Martin, Tom, and Mickey were right. And Michael Gahan and Frank Stagg before them were right also. Twenty years ago, the British government failed to defeat the prisoners and the people. Why? Because we stood as one. And today, not only have they failed to defeat the Republican struggle, but as each day passes, more people become Republican, more people join the struggle for freedom, our political strength grows, and our ability to advance our political objective grows also. Twenty years ago, the people and the prisoners stood together. Today, we stand as one in pursuit of our goals of independence, unity, peace and injustice. We are unshakable in our pursuit of equality. Twenty years ago, the prisoners were perceived to be the soft underbelly of the Republican struggle. In jail, it was felt that they could be isolated, beaten, intimidated and coerced into accepting the label of criminals. But Republican prisoners, our political prisoners, our men and women of conviction, of commitment and determination. The H block and our mob prisoners resisted. They endured horrendous conditions and they bore great physical cruelty with fortitude and courage. And at the end, when no other course of action was open to them, they went on hunger strike in defense of their integrity, in defense of their rights as Republican political prisoners, in defense of our struggle and in defense of their comrades in prison and to assert their humanity. None of this, not one part of this, was any clever Republican plan or strategy. At its very core, it was a very individualistic response by prisoners in our Ma women's prison and in the hate blocks of Long Cash. They were responding to a British strategy devised by securocrats and authorised at the highest level of the British establishment. <coughs> One leg of that strategy was about ulsterising the situation, about drawing British troops back from the front line where possible, about reorganising, resourcing, retraining the RUC, a sectarian and paramilitary force, into the cutting edge and into the front line killing machine of British and counterinsurgency, but at the same time using loyalist death squads to assassinate and to terrorise. The legacy of that policy can be seen today in the refusal, even yet, by the British government to implement the recommendations of its own policing co co commission and to create an acceptable form of civic policing. Another leg of this strategy was to attempt to criminalise the struggle, to make the struggle out to be a criminal conspiracy. It was about attempting to betray the conflict as arising from the greed of a small unrepresentative group of gangsters intent on making money and exploiting our people. Ending political status was part of that lie. And let us not forget, that despite knowing the truth, the Irish government of that day and every major political party on this island colluded in that lie. Here in the south of Ireland, the hunger strikes had a particular impact. It raised a fundamental moral question about the role of the south in Britain's war in Ireland, and it made a political impact that shook the system to its foundations. And it wasn't just the fact that Kieran Doherty was elected TD for Kevin Monaghan, that Paddy Agnew, or Paddy Agnew was elected TD for Louth, and that other prisoners, including Joe MacDonald and Maria Farrell, attracted substantial electoral support. <coughs> and remember, this was at a time when for almost a decade, this state had policed and promoted censorship. It was the fact that the hunger strike unmasked the unwillingness of the South's political establishment to do anything 
for the hunger strikers, or indeed to do anything to challenge British rule and a part of Ireland. But while the Dublin establishment vacillated and tried to ignore events in the north, the people were sound. The people had stripped away the propaganda, they'd stripped away the lies, they'd seen beyond the censorship, and they were willing to stand up for right against wrong. And we must remember that lesson every single day of this struggle. We must remember that when 10 Irish men stood against the British and its establishment, tens of thousands of other Irish men and Irish women from the 26 counties stood with them. We must also remember over the years of the peace process, when Irish governments have not been as strong as they should have been, ordinary people have stood firm and governments have been moved. And we must not forget, ever, we must never ever forget that the shape of British policy in Ireland and its aims and its objective is, objectives is dependent on how prepared an Irish government is to uphold Irish national interest and to influence British policy in this direction. How do you explain the hunger strikes? You can't. It is impossible to explain the hunger strikes. How do you come to terms with what happened? That also is impossible. It can only be understood if we appreciate the incorruptibility and the unselfishness and the generosity of the human spirit when that spirit is motivated by an ideal or an objective which is greater than itself. People are not born as heroes. The hunger strikers were ordinary men who, in extraordinary circumstances, brought the struggle to a moral platform which became a battle between them and the entire might of the British state. In the course of their protest, the hunger strikers smashed British policy. Their legacy is still unfolding, and their idealism remains as an example to the rest of us. So I want to extend to all of the hunger strikers' families, and to the families of all those who were bereaved in that awful summer, I want to extend on your behalf our continued solidarity and support in this painful year of remembrances. Sinn Féin wants, and I believe the vast majority of the people of Ireland want, a united Ireland. I also believe that this generation of Irish Republicans, not the next one or the one after that, but this generation of Irish Republicans will make that happen. Look how far we have come in examining the legacy of the hunger strikes. Look how far we have come in recent years. It has been the political initiatives taken by Irish Republicans that has been the dynamic forcing the pace of change, creating a culture of change, us acting as agents of change. And our task is to build equality and partnership and justice into Irish society, and is to change minds and attitudes. Sinn Féin, this party, is for a new beginning, and thus Nua, between the people of Ireland as equals, inclusively and in mutual respect, mapping out our own destiny, free of foreign domination, or interference. Quivino Quillon, a few years ago, described Sinn Féin as the voice of an idea. And it is an idea. It's an idealism which is both Republican and Labour. The idea of a free Ireland and a sovereign people. And in the last few years, and for the first time in almost two decades, people right across this country are hearing of that idea and supporting that idealism. Ta politiak na hurin egaharu, agus ta public tanig o gak kids den cheer kon tosi san aharu shin. Searsha, Volskilch, agus ek torch kook kon bubble, priv chimi de hin hin. Ta mij alorag nis mo na searsha palachul argir. Ta mij alor searsha socialta agus ek namiakta. Nasiri or Fud Naharan. This means not just freedom from foreign domination, but also freedom from ignorance, freedom from fear, freedom from poverty and inequality, freedom from the scourge of drugs, 
from sectarianism, from crowded classrooms and hospital queues, and housing shortages. And until such time as we pursue these goals, until such time as Irish reunification is fully achieved, Sinn Féin has adopted and is adopting a spirited, innovative and strategic approach which aims to diminish the present national democratic deficit as far as it is possible to do so by building for the Republic. Other self-styled nationalists are wannabe Republican parties, are loud on rhetoric and short on strategy and on staying power. And Sinn Féin has what no other party on this island has. Sinn Féin has the potential to become the alternative. Our credibility, our effectiveness, has been demonstrated over and over again. Commitment, determination and political will are what identify Irish Republicans, are what identify Sinn Féin as distinctive. Whether it's tackling the British government, or facing up to the scandals of corruption, or to all the other challenges presented by inequality and injustice in Irish society today. One of those crises currently faced is around the agricultural industry, or what remains of it. And it's not just over foot and mouth, although that's the most pressing issue today. Foot and mouth, E. coli, salmonella, BSE, all of this all coming together is much more than just a coincidence. For more than 10 years, the farming sector has been rocked by a whole series of crises that have all served to undermine consumer confidence in the quality of the food products we eat. And this crisis has been caused by the way that farming from family-run enterprises to one where business, where profit, where cost prevail. So in tackling the current problem and crisis of food and mouth, we need to look at the underlying problems. And there's a clear need to put quality back as the cornerstone of the Irish farming sector, right through the whole rank and raid of decisions made by individual farmers, through to the food processors, to the abattoirs, and right down to the supermarkets <laughs> and the exporters. And this party has argued for an island-wide code of principles and practices for farm and commercial food processing. We also need to examine ways in which farmers affected by this crisis can be helped, both in the long, but more immediately in the short term. Speakers earlier have spoken of the Treaty of Nice. The legal text of the Treaty of Nice has already been signed, and very few people in this state are actually even aware of that. Therefore, most people could be surprised that this treaty will move us closer into a European Union superstate, changing entirely the economic, political and military face of Europe. And we believe but for the people to allow this to go ahead without raising a resounding no would be detrimental to Ireland's interests both north and south. Because not only would it be even further dilution of Irish sovereignty, but every day that passes would see the Irish government marching us into a European army and further away from neutrality. And for us, for Sinn Féin, the democratic and Republican principle of sovereignty means recognizing the rights of people, not ceding powers to unelected officials. We want to see the European Union defending our democratic rights, not eroding them. Over the next few months, Sinn Féin will be mounting a vigorous campaign of opposition to the Treaty of Nice. This will include public meetings, door-to-door -door canvassing, and cooperation with other groups such as PANA, the Peace and Neutrality Alliance, and we also need to be building alliances with progressive forces in Europe who share our concerns. We need to clearly spell out the message that Sinn Féin's voice is for democracy and for economic and social justice. Other speakers have spoken about the elections which face us. Several will come up in the months ahead. In the six counties, there will be two elections, one for Westminster, and then for the local government elections. In the 26 counties, a general election may come at any time between now and the spring of next year. We must be ready, and I believe we are ready, for all of these challenges. In fact, Sinn Féin welcomes the opportunity 
to show the vigour which this party has and the support that is there for us throughout this island. In the north, there is no doubt but that the nationalist electorate are in good form and confidently looking forward to the elections. There's no doubt also that they've been energised by the peace process and by the very positive changes that have occurred in the psychology within the six counties. They're clearly also impressed by Sinn Féin's performance in the peace process and by our provision of strong, effective representation. So I have no doubt that Sinn Féin will, in the six counties, win more votes than ever before in these upcoming elections. <clears throat> and despite the obvious intent by the SDLP of introducing Breeds Rogers as a spoiler into West Tyrone, I am also confident that the people of that area would respond positively and that when our Ardesh eventually meets later this year, we will welcome Pat Doherty as the MP for West Tyrone. But we stand to make serious advances elsewhere. In Fermanagh and South Tyrone, for example, wouldn't it be a fitting tribute mm. to Bobby Sands if Michelle Gildernew became the first Sinn Féin woman MP to be elected since Countess Margaret? Wouldn't it be a tribute to <laughs> In the local government elections we're standing, our largest ever, our biggest ever number of candidates right throughout the, the six counties. And we'll be sounding candidates in those areas where nationalists have come under sustained attack from loyalists. And let me extend solidarity to those people who have suffered those type of attacks in Larne, in Coleraine, in North Belfast, in Ballymena, and in other parts of the North. This time round, those people will have the opportunity to vote for our party. In all of the media coverage of the Northern Election Contest, Sinn Féin's contest is generally represented as one between us and the SDLP. We're often described as having an ambition to outpoll the SDLP. We are much more ambitious than that. Our objective is to become the largest party in the six counties. This can be achieved, it will only be achieved over a number of elections, and this year's contest will see us making considerable gains as we advance towards that objective. And here in the South, and the fact that there is no election being called is more a sign of the silliness of the opposition and the ineffectiveness of the opposition than the strength of the government. So here in the South, Sinn Féin also have great things to achieve. I'm confident that our poll topping TD for Cabin Monaghan, Quibin O'Quillon, will repeat his success. I'm equally confident when he walks back into Leinster House that he will not be the only Sinn Féin TD going through those gates to shake up that system. And all of this, the building of political strength north and south, right throughout the island, will increase our negotiating power to fully implement and to allow us to press for the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, will help to advance the peace process, will face up to and be part of the fight back to clean up the widespread corruption and sleaze and politics in this state, will help to press for the more equal distribution for the share out of the wealth generated by the Irish people, for that sharing out to be to the Irish people, and it will move all of us closer to the goal, to the democratic and republican goals of independence and unity. In the North, we have been on a learning curve in relation to, like all the other parties, our input into the executive, to the assembly, and to the All-Ireland institutions. We need, as we review all of these matters, to appreciate how strong a position we're in. We have two Republican ministers in the executive, and we have 18 Republicans in the assembly. The Republican voice and the analysis is at the heart of the government, at the heart of decision making, and at the heart of all of those decisions to positively shape the people and the lives of the people of this <coughs> island. We also have responsibility for two of the most difficult ministries in the executive. And here I want to commend Barbara de Bruyne and Martin McGuinness in such a short period of time.
Barbara de Bruyne inherited a health service in almost terminal decline. A service beset, in fact, besieged with difficulties, all of which have their origins in years and years of British government neglect and gross underfunding. And to try to immediately improve that service, Barbara has initiated a range of action programs of reviews and public <coughs> consultations. And this includes a review of acute services provision, a consultation on primary care and the development of public health strategy, the setting of clear objectives and targets for the health service, measures aimed at sweeping away the internal market in the health service, and she's led the debate for an all-Ireland health service. Tashi Taresh Ve Tuntasi, a Yuzoid and Gilga in Arangum, a Stjaks and Assembly, Oichabi Orhu Korsuas, the Drohada Sheiktak Ona Intaktori, Bavolium Taku, the Irakti Barbara and Gilga a Korkon King, August Mesh May Mehin, a Shulesh and La, a Baymidge. Our thoughts and assembly August and Institute Yella, a Yano Agrono, Komoi Kena Trigilga, August Berla. Eticus between Belfast and Dublin, he has set up four education working groups one for special needs, one for child protection, one for exchange programs and for North-South teacher mobility to increase the mobility of teachers throughout the island of Ireland. And in the field of equality, like Barbara, he has ensured that his department has an equality scheme and he has added an equality division to oversee the implementation of equality measures. He has targeted social needs, aimed all the time at distributing funds more fairly and supported small rural primary schools. Irish medium education which was actually illegal until Martin McGuinness took over the ministry, had no legal status, has benefited. He set up Kolya Nagel Skoliakta in February of last year. He secured funding worth three millions, three quarters of a, of a million pounds for Irish Medium Trust Fund, and under his tutelage, it's now much easier to set up Irish Medium Schools, and two have been recently established, one in Straban and one in Coal Island. He's also initiated a review of the 11 plus, and it's my firm hope that this review will lead to the end of this lamentable and much criticised selection exam. Both Barbara and Martin, the Sinn Féin MLAs, especially those who are chairs or vice chairs of the committees, and those who serve on the whole range of assembly structures, have done a lot. But a lot more needs to be done. I would once again like to take, as I try to do consistently, this opportunity to address Northern Protestant and Unionist opinion. And as always, my comments are aimed at reaching out and finding a route into the hearts and minds of the Unionist population. And all I ask is that they listen. All I ask is that they accept my words as a personal attempt at addressing difficult and hurtful issues. Many Republicans, perhaps many in this room, have the impression and are of the view that large numbers of Unionists look to the conflict and seek to place total responsibility for that conflict in the Republican community. In other words, Republicans and Nationalists hear the voice of Unionism, especially of political Unionism, saying to them, you are morally, corrupt morally corruptible for the totality of the conflict. Taking responsibility collectively for the problem is a necessary prerequisite for taking responsibility collectively for resolving it. If one does not acknowledge any responsibility for the problem, then there will be no acceptance of the need to find a solution. I believe that we, as Irish Republicans, are facing up to that difficult challenge, or at least we're trying to face up to that difficult challenge. The British government also must face up to its responsibilities. It must acknowledge, even to itself, as a first step, the wrongs it has done to the people of this island if it is to set the course for righting these wrongs. And getting the British government to do that 
has to be the primary objective of any Irish government. And when I understand that unionists find it difficult to acknowledge the hurt which they have imposed on the nationalist community, it is important that they do so. Because taking responsibility contains another important element. It signals the beginning of a healing process. Today there are many in our society who lead by the example of healing. And in this respect I would like to acknowledge the role of progressive elements in the Protestant churches, the business community and the community sector. Their willingness to engage in dialogue was and remains an important ingredient in our society's efforts at finding a way out of conflict and a way into a durable peace. So our, and how are we to broaden out this dialogue? I have long held the view that negotiations are the key to unlock the paralysis of our hurt and pain. And for us negotiations are now very much a part of struggle. Negotiations also have to be about change. And change is by its very nature volatile. But in the course of negotiation we discover that that process develops its own anchors. Old hurts may remain, but they sit alongside a new understanding of the other. All of us stop, or have to stop, demonizing each other. We slowly begin to see the human being. We, got, we begin to look for the integrity of those who are our enemies or our opponents. We begin to dismantle prejudice and stereotyping and replace old perceptions with new understandings. For my part, the politics of negotiations demand that we, as Republicans, express a sense of the hurt and pain endured also by the unionist section of our people. And I've tried in my capacity as Sinn Féin President to consistently reflect on this. I also appreciate that going forward in this way is as difficult for the unionists as it is for the Republicans. These past 10 years, these past 20 years, have been hard ones for Republicans. We have embraced change, but not without a cost. We have lost some old friends and comrades who were with us in the early days. We have worked hard to explain and to provide our broad base of support with the necessary explanations on the political changes that happen, sometimes and often, on a daily basis. Today, more than ever, I am convinced that the only way forward is through dialogue, reconciliation and accommodation. And these are the values that underpin our engagement with Northern Protestantism and Unionism. But it is a process that all of us, every section, has to embrace equally and honestly if our past is not to be repeated as our future. Great progress has also been made. But if that progress is to be sustained, then politicians must collectively make politics and we must make politics work. The UUP refusal to nominate Sinn Féin ministers and the reduction of the institutions agreed in Good Friday and ratified in referendums north and south is wrong and totally and absolutely unacceptable. The people in both states on this island did not vote for an assembly and an apartheid executive in the north. And the failure of the British and Irish governments to challenge the First Minister, David Trimble, on this issue in a robust and forthright way is equally unacceptable. <laughs> Mr. Trimble's action is unfair. It discriminates against the section of the electorate. It's grossly insulting and a breach of the Good Friday Agreement. It is also not sustainable in the long term. Now, because I and others in the leadership want this process to succeed, we try, and I especially try to understand what motivates David Trimble and his colleagues, and I am prepared to trust him and them. But they need to know that the old days of second-class citizenship are over, and that Sinn Féin will not acquiesce in undermining the rights and the entitlements of any section of the people on this island. <coughs> There's also been a whole range of media comment and speculation about what progress, of any, was made at Hillsborough this last week. Now, it was good that all of the parties met as we did. 
But the main progress around this week's talks was made outside the talks and is represented by the IRA leadership's decision to enter into discussions with the IICD. The IRA has said, and people should listen when the IRA says this, that if this engagement is to be successful, then others also must play their part. The flaw in the handling of the peace process by the British government thus far is contained in its fixation about IRA weapons, even though these weapons are silent and even though the IRA has maintained cessations over seven years. And the political process could still fall if this issue is not handled properly. In other words, rhetoric that the resolution of the arms issue is not a precondition is not good enough. It needs to be removed as a precondition and restored as an objective of the peace process. And Sinn Féin... <laughs> Sinn Féin does not have the responsibility, we do not have the obligation, and we do not have the desire to shepherd the IRA into this army on UUP or British government terms. In any way it would not be possible. Neither should the two governments or any of the parties take for granted this party's willingness to exhaust ourselves again and again in the way that we do to resolve this issue if it is to be constantly and consistently used against us. We can only do our best. I want to place on record my appreciation for the efforts of the IRA leadership to enhance the peace process. I appreciate also and I acknowledge and I commend the discipline of IRA volunteers. I know that these are all difficult matters for Republicans. I know that many will have been shocked and confused when they hear about this latest move or that latest move. And I appeal for the utmost unity and commitment in the face of what appears to be perpetual rejection by governments and others of initiatives by Republicans to resolve difficult issues. Much has been made also about the deal which was done in Hillsborough on May the 5th and the 6th of last year. And Sinn Féin has been amongst the parties who have pointed up this development and the subsequent failure and the continued failure of the British government to deliver on its commitments. What needs to be pointed up also is that the British government is obliged under the Good Friday Agreement to deliver on most of these matters anyway. For example, the British government's policing plans do not meet the Good Friday Agreement's terms of reference for the Patent Commission. And no matter how much he may argue other ways, Mr Blair knows this. So instead of the British NIO trying to shoehorn local parties into accepting its policing proposals, the British government must go back as a minimum to the patent recommendations. The way to get nationalist and republican involvement in policing is to create a policing service which we can be part of. The same position is true on demilitarisation. The people of Republican and Nationalist heartlands do not deserve to be occupied by the British Army. There is no place in Ireland for the British Army. <laughs> and the excuse that the IRA still represents a threat is not good enough. Tony Blair Mr. Blair, the British Prime Minister, has to face up to the militarists and the securocrats in his establishment if this is to be sorted out. And that's what this latest IRA initiative has done. It has created a space in which the two governments and all of the parties working together can resolve these matters and end this crisis. So we have to build on this opportunity. And Mr. Blair has to consider whether he's about achieving that progress, that necessary progress, to make the entire peace process work, or whether he's going to sit back and dither and watch all of the gains of recent years being frittered away. For our part, Sinn Féin is determined to continue with our efforts to end the current crisis, to resolve all of these difficulties, and to see progress made in consolidating the peace process. Like you, like many people, I have been shocked and saddened by the ongoing stream of revelations about corruption being uncovered in Irish political society. What we have seen running from the Beef Tribunal through to the McCracken, Lindsay, Moriarty and Flood Tribunals is moral, 
ethical, political and human decency have been thrown out the window as some corrupt politicians and profiteers and big business put their own selfish greed before the public good. Public interests have been sold out for personal gain and private profit. All those who have been involved in this and who may still be involved in this in the main parties should be ousted from office and stopped from holding any other position of power or elected <laughs> This isn't about crude heroism. It isn't about brown envelope cultures. It's about the political establishment being involved in the systematic abuse of power. They've done it through illegal acts, like accepting money for planning favours, through hiding their money in illegal offshore banking accounts, through using their positions of power to aid their friends in a, a little golden circle. It's been about legitimatizing a two-tier society, society of thus, of us, and them. And while they've been lining their pockets, here in the capital of this island, young people in this city have been dying in the streets in the midst of a heroin epidemic. I have listened to Sinn Féin representatives from Dublin and as this plague of drug abuse goes into county towns and other cities in the state and in the other state on the island, I've listened to the anger of our representatives who are dealing with these issues, as one of them described it, at the cold face. There's been enough of equivocation, enough of double standards, enough of false promises, enough of all of the rhetoric of new dawns. There needs to be a fight back against all of this. And we, this party, needs to be part of building a real coalition between Republicans in the broadest sense of the term and all of those people campaigning for real and lasting peace in our country. We need a coalition of those people seeking an end to poverty, seeking an end to inequality, seeking the sharing of the wealth. We need a coalition of people across sectarian and racial divisions. We need to see an end to racism and sectarianism in all forms. And we need to see a coalition of people in the rural communities and people in the urban communities who have not been, who have been denied their right to take full advantage of the increased prosperity which has now been enjoyed in this state. The happy circumstance that there is a successful and growing economy has also seen a growing, a widening of the gap between the hubs and the have-nots. Walk through the city streets, walk from here today, and you'll see expensive restaurants full of customers, which is good, but you'll also see nearby young men and young women sleeping in doorways. You'll see other less visible but equally unfortunate people who are excluded and who are depraved. The last official assessment of poverty in this state showed that a third of the persons, a third of the citizens in this state, were falling below the 60% relative income poverty line. That is a national disgrace. And the failure of the economic and the political system to secure a better distribution of the recent huge increase is totally and absolutely unacceptable. That would be easy. And I think Irish people essentially in their hearts are decent. I don't believe that the Thatcherite, I'm all right Jack, has bitten into Irish society. I think the vast majority of Irish people are decent people. And they don't want, in my view, to forget those who are less well off, who haven't been able to avail of the new opportunities. While this party exists, these people on the margins will not be forgotten and they will not be abandoned. Because we believe that these are unrivaled opportunities to invest. To invest where? To invest in the Irish people and to correct all of the economic inequities and all of the economic injustices which people have had to endure over many, many generations. Just imagine, just imagine a United Ireland where the wealth is invested creatively where the wealth is invested in people. Just imagine 
where the tens of thousands of our children who currently live in poverty, just imagine them being able to wake up in warm homes, in circumstances where they're loved and where they're nourished and where they're cherished. Just imagine where in Ireland where schools were properly resourced, where parents could travel to work knowing that their children were in affordable, quality built and community run child care centres, and where no one had to wait for a hospital bed, for a home or for a job. And that isn't a pipe dream. It can't happen. What's stopping it happening at the moment is the system is geared in all our interests. We have, on this island, the resources. But they need to be managed in the interests of all the people and not just for some of the people. Who's going to do it? Is Fianna Fáil going to do it? Is Labour going to do it? Is Finn Gael going to do it? Are the PDs going to do it? <coughs> The only party which can do it is us. Sinn Féin is the only party that can put the correct course and build the alliances necessary to change all of this. And we can do it because we are the party of the people. We're the party of Pearce, of Connolly, of Tone, of Emmett, of Sands, of Farrell. We are a real Republican party determined to achieve the real republic, the republic of the people. But we must continue building political strength. We must continue to forge alliances to promote inclusivity. We must listen. We must promote democracy. We must keep our eyes firmly fixed on the prize of the twin objectives of a united Ireland and a lasting peace. What we are aiming for is the establishment of a national republic on this island. We want to build a new Ireland in which Irish men and Irish women, whatever their birthplace, or their colour, or religion, or politics, whatever their sense of anything, that they can live together in peace and in harmony. We Irish, and there are 70 million of us throughout this globe, are no petty people. We have a destiny to fulfil in realising the genius of our nation. So at times we're going to be daunted. At times we're going to come up against it. And it's so at those times when we're daunted by the challenges that we should remember the hunger strikes. It's at those times when we consider, and yesterday would have been Bobby Sands' birthday. Bobby Sands would have been 47 yesterday. Those times, just consider, and I think this is one of the greatest achievements of the hunger strikes, and I don't think it was intentional. In fact, I'm sure it was not their intention. But the fact is that what they achieved was the setting of an example for the rest of us. The women of Armagh and the men of the H-Block set an example for all other Republicans to follow. So when we falter in the face of our opponents, <coughs> let us draw strength from them, let us draw strength from their example, their unselfishness, their generosity, their commitment and their idealism. And let us not forget the words of Brendan McFarland's song, we're stronger now. You showed us how. You showed us how freedom's fate can be won if we all stand as one. So comrades, let us stand as one. The hunger strikers endure forever in our continuing struggle for freedom. Let us achieve the freedom for which they give their lives. For me again to thank uh, all the people, particularly the people of Dublin, uh, for coming here. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Diplomatic Corps. The next time we gather, it will be at a fully-fledged Ardesh, and I will undoubtedly be speaking to you that time as MP for West Tyrone. <laughs> me but to the Sinn Féin organisation in West Tyrone and to 
bring things towards a conclusion, I'd like to invite uh, Cormac Rachner up here uh, to have a bit of music and to bring this meeting to a close. Uh, I just wanted to say I uh, <clears throat> really enjoyed the uh, montage video and poetry reading. I um, found it very emotional. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes we forget those who, uh, on the international front, who um, have organized um, solidarity campaigns for us on the issues of the day, people like uh, Jacques Lagarde, who is with us here from France, um, I just want to say thank you, Jacques. Sometimes we don't thank them enough. So, uh, in deference to those of us who are not here today, I'm going to play some non-Dublin tunes. Um, the first one is a uh, slow air um, in honour of our hunger strikers, both men and women, and. A couple of reels to help you hop, skip and jump to your continued electoral success. <laughs> 